We're back in the hot seat. Thank you for joining us on your own Primal Blueprint podcast. That's a little weird, isn't it? Yeah. No, here we are in my uh, dining room, and um, which we used to call the uh, the podcast studios in beautiful downtown Malibu, and now they're in downtown Pacific Palisades. Wherever, wherever it takes, yeah. we, we chase you down, man. Exactly. Uh, anywhere around. Yep. Uh, so we did a great show on the new book, Keto for Life, with the four pillars of longevity. And I thought this would be fun to focus on that pillar number three, mental flexibility uh, and the various attributes in there because it is uh, representing sort of a extension of what you've talked about for 12 years and hammered home so hard that you shouldn't eat grains and sugars. We've already heard plenty of that, but these new insights and how they tie into living awesome and, and promoting longevity are extremely important. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the diet and the exercise are the, are the easy parts because the information is pretty finite, accessible, and uh, with a little bit of discipline, you can make them happen. I think that more, the more difficult part of this would be the developing the mental flexibility because uh, while it sounds like it might be easy in concept, uh, you know, our brains are pretty, are pretty wired to chatter all the time and to, uh, and to worry and to fret and to feel guilty and to um, take things personally and all the things that we you know, we know we, at least intuitively, we should not be doing what we tend to do anyway. So the mental part uh, is worthy of discussion and going into a deep dive today. So let's do that. Well, I have my top secret uh, little Sisson notepad of, of life-changing insights that I've gathered over the years uh, with great privilege. Here and there, you drop a bomb and I'm, I have to go think about it for days on end. And one of them... Uh, one of the concepts that you've represented so well is this ability to pivot and this this mindset of being able to go with the flow. And I think particularly because your entrepreneurial journey is so uh, you know representative of that, I'd like to I'd like to focus on this concept of pivoting and what the word means to you. Sure. Well, I mean, at its at its basis, it just means the ability to see a situation uh, that's not working for you and to be able to uh, with ease and grace move in a different direction. Uh, but, but, you know, there are lots of nuances to this. In the personal development, personal coaching world, they talk about the difference between having a growth mindset and a fixed mindset. You know, in a fixed mindset, you might say, well, um, I'm, uh, I know what I want to do, I'm passionate about it, I have my plans, I have my goals set, and I'm gonna go down this path, and nothing's gonna keep me from doing it. And you see a lot of this on the internet today, uh, you know, you, you just, as long as you work hard and as long as you grind it out and put in 18 hour days, you know, you will be successful. Uh, and I, and I, I take somewhat, uh, exception to that comment because shit happens, things happen along the way. So if you have this fixed mindset and you're, and you're really all in with your, with your plan and your program and your goal, that's great. But when things happen, I think it's important that you have the, the, willingness and the ability to be flexible and to understand that uh, maybe where you're headed is not uh, something that you want to beat your head against. Uh, maybe you have truly come up against something that's insurmountable and you need to walk around it or pivot or make a new, a new plan. Uh, and so the, the idea of pivoting uh, for myself, I mean, I'm, I'm, look, my life has been a, a, just about nothing but pivot. One pivot after another. Yeah, yeah but doesn't it, play basketball. But it's, you know, in retrospect, they all make perfect sense. Like one thing led to another, right? One door yeah. closes and two doors open is what yeah. they say. Um, so I've always been geared toward um, having a, a goal in mind, um, whether it's a business goal, uh, you know, where uh, I try one business and it isn't exactly what I had in mind, and so I try another business. Uh, whether it's an athletic goal, where I try one sport, and it doesn't work out the way I've intended, so I, I try another sport. I'll give you an example in that. Uh, you know, I started out uh, as a, a, a miler and two miler on tr you know, track team in college. And I just didn't have the speed. Uh, and I found out that as I got, as the distance got longer and longer, I was more proficient against the rest of the crowd. So when I got, finally got to, to the marathon, and I realized I'm pretty, pretty good at this, I can, I can make myself hurt for longer than most people around me. I can participate and, and, and get uh, race at a certain level that um, allows me to finish in the top 1% uh, 
or 0.1% versus middle of the field in a mile or two mile. So that was one of my first pivots. I just, I just evolved into a different uh, arena there. Uh, I did that for five years. I became, I finished fifth in the U.S. National Championships in the marathon in 1980. Uh, but I got injured. I got, I got severely beat up from, by all the training. And my choice was to either retire from competition entirely or pivot. Um, now, when you say, well, pivot, I, I mean, I could have found a new sport. I guess I could have gone and played golf, but not at the level that I was participating. So, so my pivot in athletics was um, I started riding a bike and learned the rudiments of swimming and, and was able to start participating in triathlons with using, using the endurance uh, capacity and using the cardiovascular system that I had built, but now applying it to a different set of uh, variables and leg muscles on a bike. And, and uh, yes, a little bit of running too, but, uh, but it was mostly the combination of the three. So that was a, that was a way of pivoting. Uh, so I, I was able to keep my, my focus of being an elite athlete and uh, participating at a high level, but not being so rigidly adhering to the one goal of being a top marathoner. Uh, because that just, there was a point at which I recognized it was not going to happen. I was too, you know, I had the sorts of injuries that would not allow me to run 120 miles a week. Mm -hmm. um, but those injuries would not keep me from riding 220 miles a week on my bike, you know, and running 30 or 40 miles off of that, which was enough to, to allow me to continue to participate. To participate at that level, um, you know, in business, I've just done nothing but uh, pivot from one business to the next. I was a, you know, uh, I've been I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. I'm just going back to when did it start? It started when I was shoveling snow as a 12 year old on, on school days, on snow days in Maine. Uh, Instead of going to school, or yeah, well, a snow day you stay home. <laughs> oh, and snow so days, right? You stay home. And Sorry, you, I wasn't familiar with the snow. No, day. snow day you stay home because it's there's so much snow that, that right. people can't. What are you gonna do? Get kid? out, and so you go get your shovel and you make eighty bucks. You know, as a as eighty a, bucks as a twelve year old. As a twelve year old in the sixties. Oh, that was no, that was a week's pay. That was more than a week's pay for for most people in my town. So uh, that was that was uh, blinged out when you're twelve. Yeah, I'm about that, but. Um, and then, you know, I, I started uh, mowing lawns. And so I was, you know, I was again, 12, 13, 14 in the summers mowing, mowing lawns 40 hours a week. You know, not, not just part time in between, you know, playing outside with my friends, but no, full on 40 hour week job. And then from there I started painting houses. Um, I just learned how, to, I went to spend a summer working for a contractor, learned how to paint and decided I, would, I could do it. I could make more money doing it myself. Yeah. And I did. I put myself through school, painting houses. Uh, and then uh, I, I, after I graduated college, I had a painting contracting business and I made a lot of money for a guy as a painting contractor and it enabled me to travel around the world and participate in these athletic events. Uh, so the, the, the business enabled my, my hobby of trying to become an elite athlete. Um, at some point I realized uh, I didn't want to be painting all the time. So I uh, hooked up with a, with a college buddy of mine and we opened a frozen yogurt shop in Palo Alto in 1981. Cool Licks frozen yogurt. And uh, it was an amazing success. We actually bought a barber shop. We went in, we couldn't get, we couldn't find a lease. So we, uh, we bought out Gerardo the barber for $17,000, took over his lease, um, gutted the place. And then because, because of my background as a contractor, we built this beautiful, uh, uh, frozen yogurt emporium. Uh, we were one of the first places to have, this is 1981, we had uh, uh, an overhead projector shooting uh, music videos, which, which were big uh, discs in those days, yeah. onto a screen uh, above the, the counter. Anyway, it did very, very well, and so we got excited about opening more of these things, and we, uh, we, we found a location down in uh, San Jose near Apple Computer uh, in Cupertino, and we leased that place, but it was a very big place and uh, we were, it was going to cost a lot more money to build it out than we thought and we thought, well, let's just not just not just do a yogurt, let's just do, we'll do frozen yogurt, eight flavors of frozen yogurt, we'll do a salad bar, uh, we do, built a 50 foot long salad bar that was refrigerated from underneath. We, uh, soup was, there was a place called Soup Plantation mm -hmm. that had just opened up and we were sort of emulating what they were doing. And then Mrs. Fields had just started baking homemade cookies. So we had we had soup, we had salad, we had frozen yogurt, we had uh, homemade cookies, and um, 
We borrowed money at 17 and three quarters percent because that was the best deal you could get in those days and completely, completely lost you know, our minds. I mean, we, the first year, we had, I mean, we had to make a $10,000 a month profit just to pay our debt service down. And if you know anything about restaurants, they don't, they're not necessarily profitable in their first year, let alone their first couple of months. So that tanked. Uh, and from there, I pivoted and went to uh, Los Angeles to get into sports casting. And, uh, couldn't find a sports casting job, but um, my agent said, you know, why don't you just take some acting classes and some singing classes and some um, uh, uh, dance classes. Uh, and then I did the Groundlings. I don't know if you're familiar oh. with the Groundlings, you know, the improv classes. And at the end of a, a year, while I didn't have a gig as a uh, sportscaster, I got a bunch of gigs as, as an actor. So I did some acting jobs, I did some commercials, I did, uh, you know, had some, had some minor roles. I was on Dynasty, uh, if you remember that TV show, Dynasty. There were the guy in the background that was serving the champagne at the party. That's exactly that was what Mark it was. That was, that was exactly what it was. Anyway, so um, I realized I didn't, you know, I didn't want to be an actor. I wanted to be myself. I wanted to be a sportscaster. So um, I sort of uh, gave up on that whole thing and, and shifted away. To, I was coaching um, uh, top athletes at the time. Young, hard-headed triathletes. Not, not quite uh, yet at that time, but I was, no, I was, as a matter of fact. I was, coaching, I was coaching you at that time, and then I got offered a job uh, to go run the Triathlon Federation in Colorado Springs in uh, 1988, 88, 89. So I went out to Colorado Springs, ran the Triathlon Federation for a while. Of course, two weeks into that job, who calls me? ESPN. They want me to be a sportscaster for triathlon, for the Bud Light Triathlon uh -huh. Series. Yeah, You were able to do that. And though. I did that. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. able to do it. That's good. But I mean, it's, it's yeah. just, and I, I'm rambling about my story, but, but you know, one thing led to another and pivoting and all these twists and turns and all these things have happened. And at the end of the day, you still wind up sort of following the original path, you know, it, it, whatever that, whatever that look, it just doesn't look, when you finally achieve it, it doesn't look like the, the vision you had from day one, <laughs> but you can still consider yourself successful for having identified these opportunities to pivot and, and, and make a shift. Yeah, I mean, they're seemingly unrelated, and I guess uh, one common thread I'm picking up is that you didn't give an F, you didn't get discouraged, and you just jumped to the next thing with incredible enthusiasm, and I guess maybe that was the way that you leveraged all these things, success or fail, uh, with the salad bar, you had the success of the yogurt stuff, and then you, you pushed out to the outer limit as you've been known to do throughout your life, and I yeah. guess then we're able to pull back. Yeah. But I mean, is there a common thread that you identified that well, pushed you to the next and the next? Well, the common thread is, is, is passion and purpose. It's basically waking up in the morning, and, and you know, it's, it's like I tell people, if, you, if, you're, if, you, if everyone followed their passion, we'd all, we'd all own an ice cream shop. Because right. when we're 12 years old, like, Tasty I want to have, licks or whatever. I want to have an ice cream shop. But um, our passion shifts as we learn more about life and as we get interested in things, as we find out what we're good at uh, and where our, you know, our, our own secret sauce is. So a lot of people are very, very passionate about a job that... They never envision themselves doing, but they're good at it, and they're serving people, and they are excited about getting up every morning and 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 uh, exploring what that new world looks for them. And I mean, I think that that's the key: is to be excited about uh, whatever the opportunities are for what you're doing right now at that time. So, as for me, as I you know, from, as I shifted from one position to the next, it was always because um, you know I saw I saw an opportunity that interested me. And some of the interest stemmed from my previous experience. Mm -hmm. So the frozen yogurt shop to the restaurant. Um, athletics into the, into the leadership role in athletics. Correct. Athletics into, into writing books about yeah. athletics. Yeah. Uh, writing books about athletics into writing books about health and fitness and athletics. So, tr so training elite athletes and training to become an endurance athlete was just a, a little bit this far away from average people who wanted to lose, lose weight and improve performance in the gym. So that, that was an easy transition, an easy pivot. Um, coaching elite athletes to becoming interested in the, in the anti-doping movement and getting drafted to write the anti-doping rules for the sport of triathlon and having written those rules for triathlon then becoming the anti-doping commissioner for the sport of triathlon worldwide for 12 years. So I oversaw all the drug tests. 
they all make sense in the context of athletics, interested in performance, interested in legal performance enhancing <laughs> substances, and the difference between the two. Um, <laughs> writing the anti doping it's a fine, line. It's a thin, but, fine no, line. No, but, but still, difference. I mean, then I started uh, a supplement company. Yeah. I started a supplement company yeah. because I was so interested in, in enhancing performance legally that I realized they didn't, ex you know, the kind of supplements I wish I had as an athlete didn't exist, so I started making those. Um, I started selling those to athletes. Uh, and then I realized pretty quickly, athletes don't really care that much about supplements. And so I started, my same supplements resonated with little old ladies who were living on a welfare check, but were reading a lot about, uh, you know, how I can, about longevity, and they were watching a TV show called Know the Cause that I was appearing on as a guest. And the next thing you know, my entire business pivoted once again away from selling these high performance athletes, very specific multivitamin, multimineral, uh, uh, you know, antioxidant compounds to addressing a much broader market of people who were interested in anti-aging. And so my whole anti-aging bent started at that point. And then as I started thinking about that, I started, you know, I, I have a lot of research on anti-aging. Let me put that down on the blog. Mm -hmm. And that became Mark's Daily Apple. Of course, before the blog was the TV show, I thought I'll, I'll do a TV show on anti-aging called Responsible Health. Um, shot, you know, 52 half hour episodes of that health show, aired it on Travel Channel, uh, 8.30 every morning and lost a million and a half bucks before I pulled the plug on that one. So, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry to be rambling here, but, but all this these is, things, they're, it's all about, they're, yeah, all, connect, they're yeah. all connected in ways that if you look back, you go, oh, that was a, you know, that pivot uh, not only made sense because you'd run up against uh, a, a barrier that was not going to be possible to overcome, um, but opened a door that was probably even more lucrative than, than the original decision or the original intent. Uh, right. So you, you said that word opportunity it, along with passion. And it sounds like you always had that in the background. I mean, you've had to support a family for the last 30 yeah. years or what have you. Yeah. And so if we're not just supposed to follow our passions, how do we manage, uh, you know, uh, putting the opportunity into the equation and then thinking of the, the opportunities that way or the choices? Um, I mean, I, look, I, it was important to me that I, that I maintained uh, a relationship with my wife and my kids, and that I and I fed my kids. Well, shoot, I shouldn't laugh because there's it seems like there's a few examples out there that we know about where someone just pursues their passions. Uh, what was the ice climber's name? Alex Lowe. He just yeah. kept climbing these crazy climbs, and then he died. Right? Yeah. I hope I'm right about that. Yeah. But that was a tragic story because here's this guy on top of the world. He had a little wife and kid at home, and they would stress every time he'd, he'd leave town. No, I mean, and you, yeah. you know, you hear the, the famous quote, he died what he loved doing. I mean, okay, but, but you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, Could you make that face again yeah, for yeah. our video yeah. watchers? I mean, that's exactly it. It's yeah. like, WTF, you die what you love doing, you still die. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I think it's, you know, it's, it, it's also very important in this context of metabolic, of, of um, mental flexibility to, to maintain balance and to say, uh, look, I'm gonna be very passionate about my vocation Mm. Um, um, and, but I'm also going to have, uh, you know, a good relationship with my family. I'm going to spend time with my kids. I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm going to enjoy the, the other parts of my life while I'm building this business or while I'm pursuing this passion. It doesn't have to be people who are just building business. I mean, you can be working for somebody else in a, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a creative or senior position. Um, it's not your business, but it's still your passion and you still are doing what you uh, are good at and what you can what you can provide as a benefit or service to the company that you're working for. But again, in in all of this, there's there is there are very few circumstances in which I would say it's worth sacrificing, you know, your family's well-being, welfare, and and health just because you're pursuing some some dream like that. Well, you were talking about that I think off the recording last time we were visiting about this. Uh, this reasonable tolerance for risk and how it's really difficult to uh, hit it big because it doesn't make sense to you know mortgage your home uh, to try to open a frozen yogurt shop yeah and when I did that by the way I didn't have a family I didn't have a wife I didn't have a girlfriend I didn't have kids and so my my risk tolerance was much higher I had literally literally nothing to lose and this I think this is a common thread that you'll see in people who started businesses um, that have been wildly successful over the years. In many cases, they, they didn't have anything to lose. They didn't. They weren't married yet. They didn't have kids yet. Um, they you know they they weren't 
going deeply into uh, the kind of debt that was that was going to ruin them. They, in many cases, they borrowed, you know, they used other people's money. They raised money from venture capitalists or, or private equity people. Uh, so there's a, you know, any, every person has to figure out what their risk tolerance is. And um, and I had, a, a, I still would say I had a fairly low risk tolerance. You're kidding. I had a low risk tolerance in those days. It's just that I, I had, um, I had a certain, uh, <laughs> You know, confidence that I could make something happen, and I also had a certain confidence that it, that if it didn't happen, I wasn't going to be thrown off the deep end and put into serious harm. So when I lost, um, you know, when I lost a million and a half bucks on the TV show, and I didn't have a million and a half to lose. Well, clearly I did because I lost it, and I, did, and I didn't go into debt. But I mean, I, I you know I recovered, I pivoted, I came back, yeah. I started Mark's Daily Apple, yeah. and uh, from that, it you know that that grew into. Um, a, a very viable platform that ultimately was probably more uh, powerful than a TV show that it could have had. You're saying you don't have a, a high risk tolerance? I, I mean, I really, I, I don't compared to other people. Like uh, who? I mean, yeah. it, it seems like I'm, I'm just trying to um, yeah. get to the bottom of this because, you know, my picture of you is like, you know, the, you have an amazing ability to uh, put yourself on the line and, and, and roll okay. the dice, yeah. unlike almost 99.9%. You know, so you, no, it's really interesting you say that because I, I understand where you're coming from. And I would say, look at Alex, uh, speaking of climbers, Alex Hama. Mm -hmm. okay? okay? He's got risk tolerance. He's got yeah. risk tolerance, and yet, and, and he, puts his, his, like, he puts his skills on the line every time he climbs. Yeah. Because one mistake, and he's dead. Yeah. Right? Now, I don't have that kind of. Uh, risk tolerance, my, but I, but if you scale it back, I know my limitations. I know, um, you know, uh, the likelihood of success, and I also know um, pretty much what's going to happen if I fail. Uh -huh. And and I think that's a lot of uh, what happens with a lot of people in business is they don't they, they don't they look at they dream about what will happen if they succeed, but they don't <laughs> they don't look at okay if I don't succeed, you know, uh, what's my realistic situation. Uh, you know, am I, am I, have I like borrowed all my parents' retirement yeah. money to start this, you know, dream shoe repair kit or something business that I, I thought was going to make it big and then failed miserably. And now not only am I, I have no money, but you know, I've, I've taken other people down with me. So I don't, I don't do, <laughs> no, but I mean, people yeah. do that and that's, yeah, that's big yeah. and that's not the kind of risk that I would take. Yeah. Yeah, so I, mean, I that's think like the delusional sociopath that uh, you know begs all his friends for money, yeah, and then spends it cavalierly, yeah. yeah. Which you, I mean, there's a lot of that in, in business, yeah. So you, there's a, you know, there's a, I think there's an obligation to an entrepreneur to, to assess risk, uh, to evaluate the the business that they're about to embark on. Uh, is it a good business? Like like, even if it's wildly successful, will it be a good business? Uh -huh. Um, versus, uh, you know, s s starting something and saying, well, in the best possible, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a million dollar company, you know, uh, and that's the best it's always going to ever going to be because that's the sort yeah. of the market that I'm in, the marketplace. Yeah. Here's our projections, Mark. Would you like to invest someday yeah. if everything goes well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. look, I mean, Taco Stand is a great business, but, you yeah. know, a Taco Stand in one city, one Taco Stand, you know, doing a million bucks a year, and some say, well, that's a very, that's a very successful business, but, Unless you franchise it or put more of them out, that single taco stand doesn't scale beyond that. So, um, getting into the weeds here a little bit, but I think the the ability to measure risk, uh, to understand uh, whether or not you have a great business idea in the first place, um, and again, look at it in terms of where am I in my life right now? If I have a family and I have kids and I have you know mouths to feed and 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 a roof that I need to put over people's heads, what is uh, what are the limits of, of my uh, of, of behavior that would be, become inappropriate if I risked everything and yeah. lost it? Yeah, borrowing borrowing from your buddies who are on a budget or what have you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, something like that. Yeah. Okay, so your example of pivoting was jumping from rock to rock, starting at age twelve. Yeah. I wonder also if it applies to. Oh, that's funny. We we yeah. talked about that a long time ago. What? The, uh, rock, oh, the rock to rock. Race. The rock to rock. Oh, the symbolism. No, it's whole, yeah. did, you, did you just think of that? Or it was, just uh, came out, that, man. Like, jumping from no, rock that was, rock. I, again, I was, as I was a kid growing up in Maine, Maine has no beaches. It is literally, quote, the rock-bound coast of Maine. Yeah. And all it is is a collection of boulders from, 
you know, small pebbles to, to yeah. you know, uh, car-sized boulders. And uh, quite often we would, we would run along the coast jumping rock to rock and you sort of have to, you literally pivot. You cannot, you can never run the rock bound coast of Maine in a straight line. You have to pivot, you have to, and you have to yeah. always be thinking three steps ahead, uh -huh. right? Because you, your momentum from one jump to the next, you still have to know what the next jump is after that in order to get, to get good at this. You're digging that symbolism. Um, huh? I'm gonna do something with that. Yeah. It reminds me when uh, we were in Starbucks, I was just recovering from this horrible bout of vertigo. It left me in bed for like nine days straight. And then I was complaining about my debts. And you said, so you're upside down and you have vertigo. I'm like, yeah, yeah what, what about it? Huh? Yeah, but you- Oh, oh shit. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're the one who said upside down. Yeah, I said the words upside down. And, and I like, continued okay. the conversation. You yeah. go, so Brad. You're upside down yeah. and you just, yeah, okay, so there's symbolism there. Oh, so the other uh, aspect or the other application of pivoting, let's say, mm -hmm. could be that you're uh, resolute that this Primal Kitchen mayonnaise thing is the way to go, but they ran out of avocado oil and now you have to pivot but stay focused on the end goal. How does that weave in as a different description than jumping from rock to rock? Uh, it's not a different description. It's They're very similar. It's just you have to... You know, if you keep your eye uh, down, down field and you think uh, you have, a, I mean, I had a vision for the food company and it was based on avocado oil. And in the event that avocado oil was, you know, found to either not be so fabulous for you or, uh, you know, we were exhausting the world supplies of avocado oil, um, I would have had to come up with another, another solution, yeah. uh, another choice, another, another raw material to use. Uh, thank God we didn't. Uh, and you know, we continue to be one of the largest uh, suppliers of avocado oil in the world. But, but those are always uh, the sorts of questions that you have to keep, you know, you have to be ready to address them because the other thing is every entrepreneur out there knows, uh, business is just a roller coaster. It's the, the most amazing highs when you, when you, you know, make a big sale to a company or, uh, you know, or you come up with a new product and it, and it succeeds and it, and it works. And then the, you know, then the, horrible lows where you run out of money or the product didn't work or you have a, a whole a manufacturing run that that uh, you know that doesn't turn out the way you want. I mean, you and I in, in, in publishing, you know, we've had a run of ten thousand books. This is a fantastic book. I can't wait to get it to market. Well not only that, I mean we had those we've had the duds, but also just you print the book and you realize that somebody in the in the chain of custody of the artwork forgot to change the ISBN barcode on the on the last one before it went to print. And now you have to take them all back and unbox them and put a new barcode on. Those are, I mean, but that's just the stuff you have to be, that's yeah. business. You have to be, you know, not just ready, willing, and able, but you have to, like, not even think twice about, about uh, you know, woe is me and, and how bad things are. And that, that kind of gets us to um, the, the concept of pivoting from a longevity and a, uh, and a uh, um, you know, a, a, the point of view of this ability to roll with the punches. Uh, and to maintain well-being, mental well-being, along with physical well-being. Uh, the idea that uh, if you look at all the, the, the blue zones is a good example of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a book that talks about longevity and looks at the different factors. Certainly there's the food factor and there's the exercise factor. But one of the main factors in, uh, in people who live to be 100 years old is their ability to roll with the punches, their ability to ad adapt to huge... Uh, life crises, the death of a spouse or a child, uh, the loss of a job, um, catastrophic loss of through, you know, fire, earthquake, uh, car accident or whatever. The ability to recover from those and not, you know, to move on. Uh, and that's a form of pivoting that is essential and it's a, an essential skill uh, for life that conveys some uh, amount of longevity on people or reduces the risk for early, early yeah. demise. How do you feel you're doing on that, on that objective? <laughs> well, I'd like to think I'm, uh, you know, I'm doing better, uh, but I still, you know, I still have, that's probably my weak link in, in all of my pillars is, is that part of <laughs> metabolic flexibility, of moving on, of not... Diet, really, solid. Diet, solid. Workouts, pull-ups. Yeah. Yeah. You know, making, making a living, making money, solid. Uh, but, you know, just stopping the monkey chatter in my brain. Is, is the toughest one. Yeah, I asked you off, off camera um, if you thought maybe 
you know, you, you've had this drive, which anyone can understand, a 12 year old on a, on a snow day shoveling snow instead of uh, playing, well they didn't have video games, sorry, or instead of staying home reading a book, Barely had video. And making brownies <laughs> with his mom. Yeah, come uh, so you, you've had this, you know, this insatiable competitive instinct, yeah. which has gotten you a long way in, in that sense. So uh, does that go hand in hand? You say you're getting better, which is, which is nice for the audience to hear, uh, but I don't know about, you know, do, do you feel like you're capable now of turning that volume all the way down to uh, 0.5 instead of 11? I don't think so. I think right now, <laughs> like I'm, I'm now I'm, I'm looking for the next thing, you know, so I sold mm -hmm. Primal Kitchen a year and two months ago or a year and a month ago. Oh, I thought you were just paddle boarding. Um, I was going to go, I was going to go uh, apply for a uh, paddleboard teaching job oh. in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but they rejected your resume to yeah, have experience. Over yeah, overqualified, yeah. Um, no, I mean, I'm looking for the next thing it, because it, I think uh, I feel compelled to, um, to take this gift that I have, such as I perceive it to be, and I'm not even going to be specific about what it is. I happen to think that it's identifying information in the world that's useful to people and then packaging it in a way that appeals to people, mm. but also identifying products that I think are, mm -hmm. are better for people. Disruptive. Here. Uh, disruptive would be a, would be a great you know a great a great uh, adjective for that, but I um and and since I've um, been unburdened with running the day to day operation of Primal Kitchen, I'm sort of like okay, you know, what is it about today that has me compelled to and passionate uh, to go you know hit the ground running and, and get something accomplished and, and and work toward the next goal and be willing to pivot from there. Um, and it's been a real uh, a challenge. It's not a challenge. I mean, I've got, if, for, if anything, I've had too many ideas. And now the challenge is like focusing on whatever idea it is that I'm going to, to really um, hone in on and, and develop. Uh, so do you notice sort of a, um, a shift in your disposition now that, let's say, you don't have the economic pressure uh, that you, or, or, or the drive that you necessarily had before? A little bit, but not much. Uh -huh. No, the pressure's always there. It's 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 a weird thing about having uh, money. It's it always just you just the, the pressure just gets, sort of goes along in different ways. Yeah, different I mean ways. that's your choice, but that, that might be oh, a positive rather than. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that it is, but it's it's definitely a it's a choice. Um, you know, I would say that it that it's uh, I the, the better choice would be to not worry about it because I don't have to. But and then continue to put the hammer down and, and do all the stuff, but yeah. not worry about it. But not worry about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, that's let, let's pause here and take a breath because that is, I mean, that, that's sort of the uh, the secret to probably being being the best you can be in all ways. And I, I tried to capture that thinking back to you know we were both athletes in our racing days and very caught up because you have to be and your ego is going to be a little bit fragile when you're out there training with people who are going to kick your ass one day and the next day you're you're back in the pack and it's pretty tough from that perspective. But if we could just you know, pursue the goal and, and not get caught up and not have the ego involved and not have this uh, unnecessary pressure that causes stress, maybe that could open up more doors. That's why I'm asking the question like now, Mark, you're, you're gonna be okay. We're, you know, you're, you're gonna be able to pay for your uh, home mortgage. Oh, you don't have a mortgage, whatever, you know, like yeah. you're gonna be okay. Yeah. Uh, so now you, can, now you can have that relaxed mindset. Mm -hmm. And then the edge can be entirely toward which uh, which it is. That's yeah. I mean, I think that that's. I don't want to you know um, overplay that, but um, I've gotten to that point where you know that part of the security is handled. Uh, the the that part of the brain that wants to have a secure future and, and know that everything's going to be okay. On the other hand, I think our brains tend to you know want uh, the chase, the hunt, the right. game, yeah. the challenge yeah. to overcome. I think it's a human. The human condition is to overcome. So there's this little interplay between uh, being accepting of whatever happens, and that's the pivoting. The, you know, while you're in the game chasing, and so so I mean, a lot of again, life coaches or you know, uh, Instagram uh, <laughs> gurus will say, you know, if you're not, you know, if you're not growing, you're dying, or if you're not learning, you're whatever. You're if you're not watering the plant, it's dying. something like that. Uh. Okay. Something, but but you know there is a there is an element of truth to the fact that I think it's important for everybody to always be sort of moving ahead uh, and 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 not being stagnant and complacent with where they are. Yeah. Uh, 
and I don't know what that looks like. It's different for every everybody, but for me, it's like I need you know I need to have something, some project that I'm working on, some plan that I'm working on, some some business idea, some book that I'm writing, so whatever it is, something that is taking me uh, in a direction that allows me to continue to grow and to continue to to serve. And the pivoting comes in is in in that if. If I'm heading that direction, and again, it doesn't, it looks like it's not going to work. I don't just go, okay, I'm done. I quit. Uh -huh. It's like, okay, uh -huh. now, now I, okay, I see. Now this is a bit more of interest to me, or this is maybe a better way to do it, or yeah. a better idea. And um, and I think that's that's the, again, that's the growth mindset that we talk about yeah. at the Primal Health Coach Institute. Yeah. Which we have uh, you know a lot of Primal Health coaches who are um, coaching people in their achieving better uh, health through diet and exercise and yeah. mindset and sleep. Um, the, the whole idea of a growth mindset is one of being, again, open to open to new information, um, not so rigidly tied down to a business plan that you stick with a plan or else, you know, uh, or, or, or else everything is considered a failure. If we, didn't, if we didn't do it according to the plan, it's a failure. No, in most cases, the plan is just a nice little starting point uh -huh. to be open to ideas and be able to pivot and to be able to make changes and to be able to wind up at some point in a position that you think is, that you feel uh, satisfied, very satisfied with, but may look nothing at all like what you, what you first had in mind. Yeah. I wanted to be a doctor, you know, mm -hmm. until I was 14 years old. From the age of six to 14, I wanted to be a doctor. And that's what I was gonna do, and I, and I, and I I lost my way in college, and I decided it wasn't right for me. Um, and here I am at the age of 66, um, and I probably had more effect on people's health uh, as a writer and as a blogger than I ever would have had as a doctor. So the vision, you know, was was of being a physician and helping people yeah. in a white coat and a stethoscope yeah. as a teenager. But the end result. Uh, looks far different from that, and yet it's it's a manifestation of that from day one. Yeah, yeah, you're just on the other side of the coin, yeah. keeping people away from their doctor. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you, you you strike me. I know you pretty well. I've seen you behind the scenes. Uh, that you're capable of this uh, this this badass, kick-ass day, high competitive intensity, and then able to unplug. And, and go off on vacation or have a nice evening out and, and have some sushi and not be uh, consumed uh, with, with rice, by the way. Yeah. Sushi oh, with, with rice. rice. Oh, with rice. Mark says needs rice. He has a pinch of sugar in his coffee in the morning, too. Yeah. Uh, would you, um, I mean, comment on that? What do you think? Can you I, unplug I'm not, pretty well when you need to? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Always have I'm, been? Or? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think. Um, that is part of this uh, balance that I, because I would say that there are people I know who claim to work 80, 90, 100 hours a week and never unplug, uh, and then you know go home and sleep a couple hours and go back and do it again, whether or not they have families, and I think that that's just unhealthy um, all the way around. Now, look, if you're a young entrepreneur and you've got a business that's demanding your attention all the time and you don't have a family and you don't have a relationship, then go for it. Then, then you know, Burn the candle at both ends for a while, or burn the candle at one end all the way down. I should say, <laughs> right, yeah. uh, you know, all the way down. Um, but that's not that's not conducive to a long life. That's not conducive to a happy life. That's just conducive to making potentially making a lot of money at some point. Um, so you know, there there are times in my life when I've had to grind it out and yeah. and uh, work extra hard. But for the most part, I've always kept. It. Uh, this idea that I, I I don't ever want my kids to hate me because I, I didn't spend time with them, right? Um, and uh, and to this day, they never let me forget the fact that I spent so much time with them, boogie boarding and and snowboarding, uh, you know, and, and going to their soccer games and coaching little league and refereeing soccer and all the stuff that I did. Yeah, it seems like you can uh, quote have it all in that sense. Like I'm, I'm going to argue that all that time with your kids and that that time away from the grind probably helped uh, with creative inspiration. Hundred uh, percent. Your health, your energy, your focus when you, when it was time to go to work. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Right no, I think I think people today are guilty of uh, you know putting in too much time on the clock 
and not getting enough done at, at uh, <laughs> Primal. Like, there's at, our pull quote for the episode. No, I mean, yeah, for real. Yeah. People, you know, at, at, at Primal Kitchen, we have, I'm going to say we have 80 employees at Primal Kitchen right now, and 25 of them work at the office, and the rest are scattered right. around the country as virtual employees. They work out of their homes. Do I worry about them because they're not punching a clock at 8 o'clock in the morning and then punching out at 5? No. Really, all I expect is that they get their job done, they be, they be creative with what they do. And so the way I would look at it is I would rather have an employee who, who gives me, uh, you know, two hours of focused, good, productive work every day than somebody punches in for eight hours and hangs out by the water cooler and is raiding the, you know, the cafeteria at the company and playing pool or foosball <laughs> in the company, you know, uh, rec room and not getting anything done, but, but, but claiming that they put the time in, right? So, yeah. and we live in a world where that sort of productivity is measured. Like I, people would say, well, you know, how do you measure people's, like at the end of the year, uh, how do you take an employee who's on that sort of a flex schedule, who has unlimited vacation time, and, uh, you know, and how do you evaluate them? Like, they have, we, we are very clear about what we want as a task list yeah. from them, and they are expected to meet or exceed it. Um, and after that, I really don't care how they did it. In fact, I, again, I'd rather have somebody wake up at two o'clock in the morning from, from a deep sleep and go, oh, that's the answer to this problem and start yeah. to get up and write it down than wait till the morning and come in and say, oh, I had a great idea last night, but I forgot about it when I, when I woke up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you kind of uh, covered this with your, with, your, um, with your discussion prior to it, but we're, we're trying to work our way through uh, the mental flexibility chapter and this other thing that comes up is the the dangers, the health consequences yeah. of rumination. So you said you're getting better at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But that's, I think, what, what the term would be for this running the scenarios through your head and being anxious about where sure. you're headed and all that. Sure. I mean, a lot of people, look, we have, we think about uh, a lot about what we did yesterday or what we did a week ago and wish we could take it back or do it again or have a do-over. Um, we think a lot about the future, like what if, what if this happens or what if that doesn't happen. Uh, and we spend a lot of time in, in those moments that are not the present time. And the present really is all, is all there is. Um, you know, I've, I've said this uh, in the past, um, but the, um, the, the present is a singularity through which an infinite number of possible futures must pass to become a finite past. Um, think about it for a second. The future is an infinite number of possibilities that have to go through the present time to become the past. Uh, and and uh, if we can recognize that, that so much of uh, our enjoyment of life has to do with our enjoyment of the present moment and, and, and the people that we're with, Brad, you and I are hanging out again, this is great, you know, we're talking, we're chatting, chatting it up here and we're, we're, we're actually creating some work product and we're having a good conversation, so we're you know we're we're communicating and connecting, um, versus what we would call rumination, this this getting caught up in thoughts. And uh, you know my my biggest um, issue in that regard has always been like waking up at two o'clock in the morning and starting to think about business problems that I have. And yeah. I went through a bad business cycle about two years ago for a year where I just, I, I was in a bad business deal. I had to get out of it. Um, I was, I knew it was going to cost me millions of dollars at, at the very least to get out of. It was making me sick in my stomach and I wasn't sleeping. And then my wife, she's, you know, who sort of specializes in this field, Carrie goes, look, you just got to get through your head that you're, there's nothing you're going to do at two, unless you're going to get up at two o'clock in the morning and actually yeah. fix it yeah. and make it and make a decision to start doing stuff. There's nothing you can do at two, at two o'clock or three o'clock or four o'clock. So you have to get into this space to let it go. And her, uh, uh, her, her methodology was to say, okay, just uh, lay your head sideways on your pillow and just let those thoughts ooze out of your ear into the pillow. And I started sleeping better. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you know, some little, little devices like that. You call this spiritual psychology is her, her field of interest. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit more, uh, it's, it's more general well-being as a result of uh, how we think. So the yeah. recognition that our thoughts are at, at the at the root of our well being, and uh, and so many of us you know are are not well simply because of our thoughts. Even though we're eating right, we're exercising, we're doing all the right things, you know, we're still not emotionally in a, in a, in, a, in a state of well being 
because we're pissed off at our neighbor, our spouse, our kids, our boss. Uh, you know, we're worried about the future, the past, whatever. Uh, so that's that's sort of what what she specializes in. Uh, the Carrie Sisson blackboard at the house with the uh, the daily or, or the <laughs> weekly the sink. Your yeah. thoughts are the source of all your pain. Yeah. Uh, it's what you think about what happened to you, not what happened to you, yeah, yeah. that causes the pain. Yeah. And it's it's nice and cheerful to read that, yeah. but then to take that and execute it every single day in life is yeah. the, is the challenge. But at least we can open up to the idea and acknowledge that it's that it's true and that we have the power to do it. It's pretty pretty awesome. Well, I mean, I, that's but that therein lies the challenge because I think everybody in, intellectually understands. Oh yeah, that makes sense. And then to try and actually make that happen and to try and un, un, untether yourself from those thoughts is is a whole different situation. Oh, but yeah. my thoughts are different. Yeah. You know, my my, my problems are my, real. My hard. problems are real. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So you don't understand. No, and yeah. and, and and you know we, we can talk about people who are who are uh, incapacitated, in pain, um, uh, have no money, and are happy as could be because mm -hmm. they've got this whole well-being thing sure. figured out. And all that matters is, are they happy? At the end of the day, right. all that matters is, are you happy? Right? Is this, you know, this this wet mass of fat in your head? You know, churning, churning happy thoughts versus miserable thoughts. Uh, so, what has worked for you in terms of putting that into action? Besides the oozing of the, was, the it, only... was it pus colored <laughs> ooze or was it no, blood no, no, color? No, 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 it's liquid, it's <laughs> liquid, just a clear liquid. Oh, clear. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, what um, what works? It, it's and and it's interesting because there's not like a exercise that you can do or a process. The only thing that works is recognizing it uh -huh. and going, oh, I'm having these thoughts. Uh -huh. You know, these thoughts are causing me a, a pain or a problem or discomfort. Um, I could, just like that, change those thoughts. Now, maybe it's, I'm going to come back to those thoughts, yeah. but, but just the recognition that that's what's going on is, is, is the light bulb. That's the aha moment. If you, if you can get that and observe in real time that you're having those thoughts and go, oh, that's interesting. You know, I got really pissed off at something my wife said. Um, and, you know, that, that wasn't right or wrong or good or bad. It was just, you know, her reality. It wasn't, mm -hmm. and I didn't share that reality. But for her, it was 100% real and a reality. And, and, and yet, you know, took it personally, I, whatever. Just the recognition is, is yeah. the starting point. Uh, our buddy, Dr. Ron Sinha, author of the South Asian Health Solution, expert in rumination yeah. because his high-income patients in Silicon Valley suffer from it to the extent that he's identified metabolic values associated with their, their flawed thinking. Yeah. It's incredible. He says if you catch yourself ruminating, you identify it, like you just said, and he said if it keeps happening, you just get a, a bowl of popcorn and pretend like you're watching your own movie. You just sit back and, and let, it, let it run out, but have that distance from it. You know what's funny is I, the term rumination. One of the quotes that Carrie put on the blackboard is from Rumi. Oh, oh it's yeah. from Rumi. <laughs> Rumi doesn't like rumination. No, 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 Rumi. <laughs> and Ron Sinha is from the nation that Rumi comes from. It's, it, 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 so he's from R Rumi Nation. Rumi Nation. Oh well, I anyway. oh, love it. You're good with those word things. When, when Paul Saladino came in, you started the podcast going, so your name's Salad, I know. Yeah. Yeah, fun times, yeah. kicking it off. Uh, so then we got to this concept of journaling. I know Carrie's big time into that scene, and you've been uh, dabbling in it uh, increasingly. And I wonder what's worked for you along those lines, or uh, do you uh, do you have your own little process to connect with gratitude, which is, I guess, one of the main attributes of journaling. Well, so in terms of journaling, my journaling is basically writing ideas down for books. So I don't, uh, I write, I carry a spiral uh, or a you know, composition notebook with uh -huh. me, but I don't. It was found at LAX recently, I heard. Oh, no, no, okay, yeah. Your, your notebook. Oh, I mean, because I, I lost one recently. <laughs> oh, <so. laughs> and His it, face is going. And they, and they go yeah. back, they go back a ways. Um, but that's the extent of the journaling I do. I should probably uh, do more. And I've tried some over the, over the years. I just, I don't, I'm not disciplined about it that way. Um, so, uh. Um, and what else? What was well, it? you're connecting to gratitude as well. Oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I try. I try to do that. You know, 
literally on, on uh, off moments. Like if I, that's like my, my go-to if I'm feeling down or bad or, or, uh, or stressed, that's, that's my go-to. Um, because it's a, uh, sort of a, a, a technique I learned in the meditation world is one of the, one of the ways to get set into a meditation is to start by, you know, uh, ex expressing gratitude, you know, the three things you're grateful for. And that kind of gets you into a, into a state of, uh, um, uh, readiness to accept. Yeah. Lower uh, stress hormones in yeah. the bloodstream, yeah. all that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you'll do that as needed as a go-to. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's yeah. that's my. I don't have a regular um, time of day for it. Yeah, because it, it felt when I was doing it for a while, it felt like uh, I was um, having to do it and coming up with, uh -huh. you know, with things that that didn't. Uh, I had to because I was forced. It was homework, right? Yeah. But when it wasn't yeah. homework, and it was like, okay, this is okay. I feel myself going down there. Okay, what am I grateful for? Right, right, this moment. You know, what do I? Yeah. And that's kind of what you gotta force it. Yeah. What, yeah. Well, now it's like instead of being forced, let me see. I'm, let me see. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm sitting here. It's a cup of coffee. It's 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 uh, gratitude time. You know, it's going to be versus when it's forced upon me. It's like okay, what around me? What you know? What immediately am I grateful for right now? Without having to make stuff up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Grateful that my car got me to this spot right now. Yeah. You know, didn't run out of gas because I was wrong. Grateful, you know that. Uh, you know that that the mm -hmm. that the um, my feet are, are are healthy because they were hurting the other day, and I don't I don't feel them at all right now. So, you know, little, yeah, little you things. um you you wrote a nice post. Or I, I like the direction where you said it, you, there's no rules, and you can you can be grateful for your badass new car that you just bought, and also for your arches not hurting, and it can yeah. cross over from the material world to yeah. uh, the spiritual. You're you're grateful to be here, breathing the air in in South Beach, and the yeah. sun's shining on your bronze skin, you know, it can go all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, journal if you, if you wish people, it's highly recommended. Uh, the, we, we put in there about the experts, but I also, uh, can embrace that idea that you don't want to force it and just, you know, when you're ready, yeah. it might be 2021. Who knows? Yeah. It's all right. Yeah. Like I say, I, I carry uh, a book around with me, uh, a composition book all, and I like to write it me mechanical pencil. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like Dr. Seuss. I guess. Um, he wrote all his books uh, by hand on legal pad. Yeah. And he would get on an airplane. He was from San Diego. And uh, he'd fly to New York City and hand the manuscript over, the one and only copy. Imagine if, like, someone had he'd left it in the, the yeah. seat pocket in front of you or something. But that was his, that was his way. He didn't do machines. Right. Because for whatever reason. Yeah. I, was just, I just read all of, all of the places you'll go to... Uh, J JJ this morning. Oh, oh cute. That's yeah. your grandson? Granddaughter, yeah. yeah. Oh, how old is she? Five months, yeah. Oh, okay. So she didn't, yeah, so she she didn't her get eyes it. are open. I, I, read it, I read it for my, my own edification. But, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, it, it has an impact as yeah. the, as the brain, brain research yeah. shows. Yeah. She's getting those words in her head. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then we get on to uh, kind of the final closing section of the of the uh, of the chapter and, and, and the podcast today. Thank you for your time. But this is the importance of social connection yeah. and the disastrous uh, consequences that we're seeing in the digital age of uh, loneliness and isolation. The stats we put in there were pretty scary. We're both going, holy crap, is this true? And we had to dig deep and find out that 26% uh, of Americans are now, uh, you know, identified, classified as lonely. Yeah. Uh, that this is this is very interesting because you know you and I can both relate to half of our lives or whatever that was lived without the digital world and now we're in this new scene oh more than half of my for sure <laughs> yeah. no I mean all, when I was growing up all I had was my, I had my friends and uh, you know we hung out all the time and we played together and, and, and you know went on triple and quadruple dates together and it was yeah. you know there were, there were groups of six, seven, eight people that would do stuff all, you know, all the time together so yeah. we really had that that uh, tribe um, effect and that tribe concept. Uh, many of, of those people are still friends of mine now. You know, my roommate from prep school is you know still one of my closest friends, and we we stay connected all these years. Meanwhile, people today seem to have, you know they have five thousand Facebook friends and you know hundred thousand Instagram followers, and yet they don't really know any of them. And worse than that, most of their friends don't know them. They think they know them, but they don't. So I think this this um, you know, human connection is is uh, 
it's wired. We need it. It's part of our psyche. It's part of our DNA. It, our, our genes expect us to be uh, in close contact and uh, speaking directly to and eye gazing and touching and hugging and all the things that we, you know, we, uh, that we re recognize as sort of human, be human behavior, at least um, historically, have gotten kind of subsumed and put to the side as we have this digital world of connection. And like, I want to cry. I go into a room and I see eight teenagers or even millennials sitting around in a semicircle all on their, <laughs> on their devices. Um, you walk down the street and everybody is, you know, tuned to their, to their phone. It's, it's beyond ridiculous. It's just, it's sad. And I don't know, uh, you know, if there's going to be some, you know, massive backlash against that at some point. Legislation? No, I, I don't see that <laughs> happening. But I, you know, I, yeah, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't make me feel great about the future. If we can't pull back and start to understand how important human connection is on a one-to-one -one basis. And you personally, are you fighting this battle? Do you notice uh, in your daily life the... Oh my need God. to have boundaries or a, 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 a reduction in attention span like I oh, reference for myself. Oh yeah, no, I have, I have a dramatically reduced attention span. What were we talking about? I, uh, yeah, I know. Um, no, I, look, it, and it started with my work. I mean, you know, I'll do some research for an article and I say, you know, I am going down rabbit holes talking about pivoting. I'm, you know, I'm yeah. linking to this and linking to that and linking to this and the next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm miles away from where I started, but God, it's interesting. You know, it yeah. like, and you know, the, you're referencing yeah. a, a really good positive aspect of sure. technology, the exchange sure. of information. But, you know, uh, but you know, you start out looking at uh, you know the origins of, uh, of global warming, and you know, forty four links later, you're looking at uh, what happened to the forty celebrity child celebrities from the 1970s. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like bizarre how how you know that that chain of that uh, that link chain goes. So. Uh, it does take discipline and it does take uh, some thinking about it and go, you know, I think, you know, we have to find time where we just completely uh, disconnect from the devices, of all devices, the, you know, the, the, the tools that you would, um, that we talk about in the book. I mean, you know, allow yourself an hour a day to actually mm -hmm. be involved in email and then mm -hmm. nothing else because nothing comes into your email that, would dem that demands your attention sooner than 24 hours for the most mm -hmm. part. Um, uh, you know, don't get so connected with, with uh, you know, your, your Instagram persona. It's not who you are. Th that's the thing that's kind of going around now. I think a lot of the people on Instagram are recognizing that. That's not who you are. And so, mm -hmm. you know, so now people have gone the other way and they're, they, they're taking really uh, ugly, unposed shots of themselves and saying, this, oh, is, nice. this, is the real, this is the real me, not the Instagram. I didn't know that. Oh, You're yeah, going to have to yeah. step up. Yeah. So, okay. Anyway. Yeah, no, I just all of which is just to, to say we, we just need to spend more time um, with real people connecting. Uh, you know, go to a, I mean, that's, go to a pub and have a beer with a friend. Uh -huh. Have a gluten-free beer with a friend. <laughs> uh, and then uh, as a part of that conversation, we identify that the, the love relationship is number one. It's probably the number one make or break longevity aspect when you compare a, a really uh, happy successful one with a dysfunctional one. Yeah, so exactly, going back to the blue zone concept and longevity and, and centenarians, uh, the, the long, people in long-term relationships, long-term healthy, happy, loving relationships live longer than people who don't have relationships or who are in not so loving, toxic type relationships. So it's not just like be with somebody, it's like be with somebody. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And now you've been at it for 30 years with Carrie, 30 yeah. plus, yeah. right? Yeah. What's, what's some of your reflections? Um, no, it's tough. Uh, you know, it's, it's oftentimes it's very easy for couples to say, you know what, that's enough, we're done, let's go. Especially so, today with yeah. the distractibility yeah. potential. Yeah. 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 So, so, you know, we've, we've, we've hung in there and we've, you know, we've worked through th some things and we're great now. And, um, you know, we respect each other's um, boundaries and personalities, and um, so we work, we work well together. Yeah, yeah. and you feel like, um, I, I think you guys have some uh, nice balance between independence and then connection, and it seems to be important. Dr. John Grady said that you have to kind of 
make yourself happy and then you can have a relationship no, to make I, you happier. I think that's, ex that's exactly uh, the realization we came to. Was that, you know, it's up to each of us to make ourselves happy and then we can build on that with the two of us. And what's next, Mark? Your, your next thing is top secret. Yeah. Well, uh, you want to talk a little bit, a little teaser about the next book because it's kind of exciting to us anyway that we're uh, I, kind yeah. of cutting through this nonsense and this, uh, the diet wars, especially with, in, the, in the age of uh, propaganda and documentary uh, mind, mind washing. Uh, what's the solution, man? Well, eating less food. <laughs> eating less food. But how do you do it? Because Did you speak into the microphone? <laughs> eating less food, Mark says. Yeah. Um, no, that's what it is. It's eating less food. The, the challenge is how do, you, how do you get to the point where you're okay eating less food and you're not hungry and you're energetic and you're, you, know, you have all of the positive aspects of enjoying food, um, enjoying every meal, every, mm -hmm. every bite you eat, and eating less of it. And uh, so that's the book will we'll deep dive into, into that. Love so, it. you know, a little, it's a little bit of fasting. It's what we would call intermittent eating versus intermittent fasting. But um, all strategies on how to make it uh, work for you as a, life, as a life strategy, not just as a short-term fix. Intermittent eating, new vocabulary term. Yeah. Shifting the cultural mindset away Always. from Always. Uh, intermittent fasting. Yeah. Huge difference there. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening, everybody, and watching on YouTube. Thanks for having me on my show.